Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. Welcome, welcome, y'all, to the Switch for Good podcast. Here we are again. Uh, Wow, it is incredible to be back because I've been gone for three weeks, and we haven't recorded, and I've missed you, Alexandra. Good to see you, Dotsie. <laughs> uh, so I uh, took an adventure with my husband to Mallorca, Spain, which is a, a, a magical island off the coast of Spain. And we lived there for uh, a little over three months in 2012, right before Olympic Games in London. So we lived together with the U.S. team and just lived and trained and, and were together uh, on the track and on the road and just preparing uh, for that big event in August of 2012. And Kirk and I have always, always wanted to go back because it is, uh, it's, it's a magical place. The riding is the best in the world, in my opinion. And so we said, we want to take our road bikes and, and go spend time there uh, on a vacation, right? When we didn't have such a intense looming event at the end of, <laughs> at the end of our, of our stay there. So we went back. I just, I just returned uh, three days ago and we had, a, we had an incredible time. Uh, but one thing that really, really shot out for me that I noticed that I was surprised by and, and, and shocked and, and, and mostly saddened by is obviously uh, off the coast of Spain, it's the Mediterranean Ocean, and it is crystal clear blue water uh, and very warm. So you're, you want to get in it a lot. And when we were there before, we, we took a few breaks and would go out on boat and, and just snorkel. So we did that this time as well, as you you do want to spend a significant amount of time in the water there. The water still is crystal clear and, and very blue and beautiful. But the snorkeling experience that I had was so different than just nine years ago. And I think with uh, climate change and uh, ocean acidification from fossil fuels and uh, animal agriculture runoff and overfishing, uh, I, I, I know those, those three aspects of, of, of the many that are hurting our ocean. But when it's not in front of you every minute of every day, for me, it's easy for me to forget. And it's easy for me to, you know, I'll just say it, you know, it, when I'm traveling by a water, if I'm really thirsty, uh, you know, and, and maybe I, I have forgotten my, um, you know, tin water jug. I just, it, it, I don't know, maybe I'm just weak, but it's like something needs to be just right in front of me. Well, the experience and the difference from nine years ago, snorkeling was right in front of me. Nine years ago, there were, there, there was a plethora of fish. I mean, there were so, there's so much variety. There were so many different fish to look at and experience um, and see and, and dance with. I actually danced with a couple of fish there. Kirk has video, underwater video. Um, and the reefs and the coral and the plant life was, we were, they were just vibrant. I, I, there were so many colors. It was, it was magical. It was just like you see in the movies. Uh, and when we went back this time and snorkeled, it was literally as if somebody had taken a spray paint gun and just grayed it out. It was it was it was gray. The, the 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 vibrant colors had lost their vibrancy. Bright pinks and bright oranges and bright blues were just you could barely see the pink in the gray. You could barely see the blue in the gray. And Alexandra, I, I saw four fish 
I, I, I mean, it was just like in passing, there would be one that sh would scoot by or maybe come out of a rock. Um, I'm sure there's more fish elsewhere, but uh, in, in our Facebook group, as you know, I shared a story about being out on a stand-up paddle and uh, experiencing seeing an ocean trawler for the very first time myself. Uh, I've seen them on many videos. So, so many people commented on that and said, you know, seeing something live versus the videos that we see it in is, um, it just, it just ripped my heart in half. I, I just sat there on that stand up paddle. I sat down, put my legs in the water and just, and just, just cried. Uh, just thinking of, of the massiveness uh, and, and, and the boldness and the wickedness of the destruction. And so I'm assuming that's one of the reasons I didn't see uh, very many fish this time. So yeah, the coral, so the coral is live. Coral is, is, a, is an animal. And so when it dies, it turns gray. It loses its color. So you saw dead yeah. coral, dying so coral. The, so that's what I was, that's what I was seeing. That's what I was seeing. I guess, you know, this is, this is kind of a, bit of a bummer. This is depressing. We have uh, our youngest guest ever on today. And, and so this is, uh, you know, this story and this situation that we're in and the planetary responsibility that we have to her generation is, is looming. It's huge. And it's now. I think that's the point of why I'm bringing this up. What can we do right now? What are the steps that we can take right now? Uh, and moving away from animal agriculture and moving away from our reliance on animal agriculture and eating animals, uh, eggs, meat, and dairy is, is, is number one, right? It's hugely important. It's something that each of us can do. And of course, the, uh, the animal agriculture sector uses, uh, emits more greenhouse gases than even the transportation sector worldwide. Yeah. And that's that's profound because when I look at the sky and the road and straight out at my street in front of me, uh, there are a lot of vehicles <laughs> and there are a lot of airplanes. And to, to have it uh, be more expansive and bigger uh, than that. So, you know, there's a, there's a just a couple of, you know, stats on the environmental impact of uh, dairy, let's say, that really rise to the top for me that just uh, I think bring the reality for me uh, closer and in more color because I need that. I need to constantly be reminded, sadly. I'm, I'm not good at, um, I guess it's the Pollyanna aspect of me where it's, you know, everything will be fine. It's good. We're trying our hardest and, and many of us are, uh, but I need to be reminded and maybe some of our listeners feel the same way. Uh, but we were talking about ocean acidification and waste from animal agriculture, and that's one of the uh, leading issues uh, of, of our dying oceans. Uh, fossil fuels are also a big part of that ocean acidification. But waste from a dairy farm of just 2,500 cows is equivalent to waste from a city of 411,000 people or 90 million pounds of waste a year. That's it, well, that's so expensive, it's almost hard to wrap your brain around. Uh, but waste from dairy farms and animal agriculture in general is stored in massive lagoons, as we know, that are prone to leakage, very much so. They, they seep through uh, the, the walls and into, uh, you know, into the dirt and into the soil. And in 2019, 30 million gallons of manure uh, ruptured from a dairy farm in Oregon, contaminating the surrounding land and water systems. And this happens fairly often. And I don't think it's ever in the news. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen any major news station cover anything like that. Um, so that awareness and that uh, just that those stats right there, and we, as we've said on this podcast, or I do a million times because it just blows me away, um, that it takes a thousand gallons of embedded water to create just one gallon of milk. Uh, and people so easily just grab that gallon of milk off the shelf. And that is a whole lot of embedded water, embedded fresh water, uh, when, you know, over a billion people 
don't even have access to to fresh water. I saw a meme the other day that was, I think, you know, it's been around for a while, uh, but it was a child, uh, a, a child of color um, in, a, in a poor country. And it just said, you mean y'all crap in perfectly clean water? It's like, yeah, there you go, big. right? That's just, yeah. We waste so, a lot of water here, that's for mm -hmm. sure. Every American uses on average 175 gallons of water a day. And that's, what? yeah, that's embedded into all the things that we use, the toilet, we, when we flush the right. toilet, cook, et cetera. But a lot of that's clean water that we, for example, the toilet or water in the gardens. And it's really, it's really a shame that we haven't, I know it's a huge deal, but it's part of our infrastructure that we need to change uh, if we're going to really uh, yeah. be able to have so many people inhabiting the planet with animals and have clean water. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's get to Haley because she inspires me so much uh, to think forward. Uh, and I've gotten to spend time with her a few times um, in, in, in Portugal and in Washington, D.C. At, at, at speaking events. And she is uh, pretty much as wise as someone who's lived an entire life. So we're going to we're going to be empowered and we're going to learn so much. Let's get to Haley. Well, today's guest has likely graced more speaking stages than both of us combined. And she's been featured on the Food Network, Good Morning America, The Dr. Oz Show, and a dozen other talk shows. Here's one of the many amazing tidbits about Haley, though. Alexandra, she is less than half our age, much less. <laughs> Haley Thomas is a youth empowerment activist and founder and CEO of Happy, a nonprofit she launched when she was 12. She's also a recipe developer and author of Living Lively, a cookbook with 80 plant-based recipes to fuel your wellness journey. From speaking at the Smithsonian Virtual Food History Weekend to cooking for Michelle Obama during the first White House Kids State Dinner, this girl is on fire and has been for most of her life. I had the awesome pleasure of meeting and hanging with Haley and her mom in Portugal in late 2019 when we were both there to speak at a conference. And I have a few stories from that adventure about Haley that I want to share with you all throughout this interview. Mm -hmm. But Haley, we are both so pumped to have you on our show and to learn from your two decades of activism. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful to be here with you both and for the very uh, humbling and kind introduction so thank you oh you bet that's just like a an eighth of the story so <laughs> or a 16th we're we're gonna dive in but uh i was thinking about where to start uh your 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 journey is fascinating and i like i mentioned got to spend some time with you uh and uh, there, there's so many uh intricacies around it that that uh i, I want to dive into but I'm such a big fan of your your vegan origin story, I'll call it, and how you changed your your daily menu, your family's daily menu, um, as you were all focused and passionate about healing your father, which is it's just such a beautiful, beautiful journey. No one tells that story better than you do, so don't worry, I'm not going to tell it. I'd love for you to start uh, with that story so our, our audience can hear it from you, uh, it, because it was really the catalyst to all of the amazing work you do today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even just thinking back on uh, my story with my dad and, and everything, it makes me think of how really the the most um, the most relatable and and quite universal stories and moments in our lives can act as these catalysts for change beyond our imagination. And and just in thinking of my own journey starting in that very small moment, it makes me think of how all of us have this potential within each of our stories and, and health experiences to uh, connect it to a greater picture uh, if we you know, feel called to do so. And for me, it was through my family and my dad's diagnosis of type 2 diabetes when I was around eight years old that really um, completely uh, turned our world upside down in the best way possible. Um, when he was initially uh, diagnosed, you know, the doctor told him that uh, it ran in the family, that this condition was just kind of inevitable. Um, but through my mom and, and dad being really passionate about kind of coming to their own conclusion and doing additional research, um, that's when we found out that it wasn't necessarily something that he had to get and had to suffer through. 
but rather that you know the lifestyle choices that we had adapted were passed down, uh, not necessarily the disease itself. And so through this journey of looking at food as a healing tool, uh, eventually within about a year, we were able to completely reverse his condition without the use of medication that you know had horrific side effects. And so to be able to do that um, was an incredible win in of itself, but also everything that we learned on that journey of reversing his condition was invaluable. I mean, learning about the food system and, and factory farming and, you know, GMOs and um, the the unethical practices, not only for, you know, workers, but also for animals and, and all of the intricacies of the food system, seeing this kind of ripple effect and, and the way that ripple effect impacts everyone, um, a part of that system was really eye-opening and especially learning about uh, my generation being impacted uh, at such early ages was, um, was disheartening, but also it, it made me feel as though there, there couldn't just be like the only answer was just kind of sitting back and watching it. Um, and that's when I realized that maybe through my experience with my dad and my own love for cooking and food, I could help my peers also learn something about the importance of taking care of their health and well being and how that can also connect them to community and service. Yeah. <clears throat> Tell me real quick I, I, when you, your dad goes to the doctor. You know, and they said, mm-hmm. you're, you know, you're, you're in, you're in route to type two diabetes or you already have it. Which one was it? Yeah. So he already had it, not pre-diabetic. Okay. He, he was a full on diabetic. So here's your medicine. Here's mm-hmm. the pills. Um, my, one of my, my dearest friends husband just got diagnosed last week and it was, mm-hmm. here's the pills. You're going to have to take these for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. And they asked about diet and exercise. And he was like, well, you know, you could make some changes, but you're still gonna have to take these pills for the rest of your life. So dad comes home and what, what, who, who makes the first move, the first chest plate to hold on, let's dive into what's going in your, in your body from, from a diet, from a nutrition standpoint. And then how did dad react and what did he think? Um, Well, our dad has never really been uh, a chef or interested in cooking or food um, as much as, you know, myself and my sister and my mom. And so um, really it was my mom who kind of kickstarted everything. I think that the great thing is that our dad really trusts our uh, perspective and the things that we kind of look into. And he honestly didn't have the capacity at that point to take it on um, on his own. And I think that also links to the importance of having support networks and people that you can uh, lean on who also care for you, because I think many people go through uh, these diagnoses without any support, without any um, help in discovering new and different alternatives. And, and it's a lot easier to just kind of submit to taking this medication instead of reworking your entire life. and creating space to learn more and to, you know, change your lifestyle and diet. And so um, to kind of have that support system was so important firstly, but um, my mom and and you know her, she's definitely very fiery person. So she was like, ah, I don't know about this with these side effects. Like there's gotta be something else that we can do. So she just started researching. And um, one thing that's really great about our family is that we're very open and just kind of share what we're learning or, or looking into. And so at the dinner table, she would just kind of casually share the things that she was learning about. Um, and then eventually started involving my sister and I in just like changing out the recipes that we used to make and incorporating more plant-based ingredients. And then we started watching like food documentaries together. And so it eventually became this um, family mission to really help our dad. And I think without that support, I'm, I'm not quite sure how possible it would have been at that time, you know, when my dad was juggling like several jobs trying to support his family. And so, um, you know, to be able to have the, the privilege of that support system, I was definitely a very, very powerful point. Yeah. What, what were you eating before and what did you, have you come to now? What kind of lifestyle do you have as a family and especially your father? Yeah. Um, so before both of my parents are Jamaican, so we ate a lot of uh, red meat and fish, um, a lot of white rice, uh, very, very uh, heavy on the white rice and um, very limited vegetables. So it was it was basically that that standard diet, lots of gravies and sauces and just not very intentional. It was kind of, you know, recipes that 
we just grew up eating and my parents grew up eating everything tasted amazing but there was no um mindfulness embedded in that at all and and not much awareness of like how these ingredients impact our bodies. And so the transition was from a very heavy animal-based diet, lots of cheese for me, lots of dairy. Um, I was very much addicted to that. Um, my dad, not so much. Uh, he never really liked dairy products, but um, it was definitely meat and fish for sure. Um, and now we've all transitioned to a vegan diet. So um, in that way, it's definitely a complete 360, But Um, it's been so interesting being able to kind of continue to honor our cultural roots through plant-based eating and um, to find that there's so much creativity in embarking on a new lifestyle, especially a plant-based one. And that often within many of our cultures, there are so many roots in plant-based eating and, you know, eating off of the land and cultivating it in a really um, special way. So I, I was grateful to also kind of lean into that aspect of, getting to be creative, uh, becoming vegan uh, eight years ago now, I think. And um, yeah, it really unlocked a whole new culinary world as well. So the great thing was that that transition was fun too. You know, it didn't feel like as agonizing because we were really open to the experience and we didn't feel as though we were losing something, but rather gaining a lot of of vitality and and kind of a second chance at um, really taking care of our health. And so as we continue to be on this vegan journey, I think every day is just, is the same as really trying to figure out how we can continue to cultivate well-being. And how is your dad? Yeah. Yeah, he's doing great. It's it's amazing to see the power of plants like actively, not only in my own life, but also through my dad and, and what he went through. So um, to be able to experience that is definitely a gift. So to in- encourage or inspire people, how, how long did it take before he was able to, to, to stop the medicine? And was it, did he kind of go gradually or as, as your mom was learning more and researching and kind of starting to cook or was it a, was it a, a, a bit abrupt? Uh, I think so many people feel just like they're in prison when they get yeah. that, you know, this is what you have and here are the pills for the rest of your life. And mm-hmm. it's, yeah. No, so he never took them. Um, We decided to just kind of take a leap of faith with the direction of food and, um, and it works. So that was really helpful. I mean, of course, um, it's important to like, listen to your doctors and healthcare professionals. But um, for us, especially back then in like 2008, you know, this idea of holistic medicine and even having options to, you know, visit a holistic doctor, or a doctor well-versed in plant-based lifestyles or the importance of, you know, overall well-being that was not uh, available then. And so um, now that those things are options, it's, it's great and definitely makes it where uh, the conversation can expand, you know, with healthcare professionals and the fact that doctors kind of expect their patients to potentially be more well-versed in like diet and, and, and uh, physical fitness than they are is, is actually an interesting dynamic. But um, then we kind of just had to figure it out on our own if, if we didn't want to go the route of medication. Wow. That's so encouraging that, that, I mean, it's, it's, it, my friend's husband is just, you know, it's, it's scary to not take the pills and so he is but they're gonna they're gonna find a new way for it and they're gonna listen to this Mm -hmm. episode and it's like (laughs) it's just it's so so encouraging um so so you are taking this journey with your family and you're all you know lifting up dad and supporting dad and this is the this is the, the purpose and you're you're transitioning the food itself but when i hear you talk about the flavors and the herbs and the spices and the plants uh, that are in Jamaican food. I, I start salivating every time you start talking about it. And I, what I realized and I, what I love so much is that you took all of that and just applied it to plant-based food instead of, like you said, uh, the meat and the fish. So take us through a couple of changes uh, that, that, that you made. Like, instead of the meat or instead of the fish, you did what kind of herbs and spices, spices, what type of Jamaican herbs and spices on what that is delicious and incredible and help, help dad to get to the other side of type two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I feel like it was first a lot of trial and error. We weren't really well versed in uh, plant-based alternatives and tofu and things like that, tofu tempeh. 
Um, and also then there just weren't many like alternatives that were like meant to be replacements, you know, no beyond anything or impossible this, like, you know, nothing. And so it was more so, it was gradual at first. We kind of started with replacing the um, the simple carbohydrates. So like the white rice and white bread, things like that, we were uh, swapping out first. So we started with just cutting out red meat entirely and then only doing like seafood. So instead of like, you know, curry goat with white rice, it would be like curry shrimp and a lettuce wrap. And then eventually as our palates kind of adjusted to um, more plants, then it became a little bit more feasible to go into a plant-based lifestyle. And it wasn't an overnight thing. Um, just by being more plant-based, we were able to reverse this condition. And then a few year years later, we were able to make the full shift into veganism. And so um, in a weird way, unconsciously, we were kind of leading up to that ultimate choice to go vegan um, just by that embrace of plants a few years earlier. But really, it was exactly what you were mentioning. Like, all, all it is is really spices and like cooking techniques and uh, fusing different flavors together and everything else is just a canvas. So viewing it in that way, you know, we would take our, our rosemary and allspice and cloves and, and ginger and those warming spices and just apply it to different canvases essentially. And so I think that creativity and willingness to experiment and uh, try new things is also so so important because it is a whole new territory and landscape but at the same time you can find senses of comfort and senses of home uh, within those different flavor combinations and you know you don't have to be a chef or like culinary expert to just kind of deconstruct the things you love and bring it together in a, in a new and different way and so um, that's definitely what I encourage is just for you to be creative and kind of have fun with it throughout the process and and to look at it not from a deprivation mindset but really from an ex a, and a mindset of expansiveness and the fact that you are creating a whole new experience for yourself yeah and discovery yeah absolutely Love that. since we're talking about cooking uh, tell us about your cookbook your new cookbook living lively it's uh, has only gluten-free and vegan recipes right yes Yes. Um, so Living Lively came out uh, last July, which is already just so uh, insane that it's been over a year now. Um, but essentially, the book is really um, not only rooted in creating um, narratives of plant-based eating that uh, feel accessible and providing tools to people for them to see, you know, how to make that swap, how to deal with the social aspects of it, the accessibility aspects of it, um, but also really how to look at the other elements of wellness in our lives that contribute to, you know, our overall sense of well-being. And so um, in Living Lively, it features these really delicious like favorite recipes of mine um, that I've made in my own kitchen and enjoyed with my family um, alongside like journaling prompts that you can explore to really dive into those other elements of wellness and in the book those elements are labeled as the seven points of power so um, just different areas of in our lives that we can nurture and nourish in order to reach our fullest potential or to you know, continuously strive towards that. And so um, I think the book is a really kind of unique combination of these two worlds that we often view as separate two worlds, but in reality are, are so uh, deeply interconnected. And um, it's been really fun seeing people not only enjoy like, you know, banana bread, French toast sticks, but also like journaling about their uh, experiences with creativity and community. So um, I love that those those things can live and and interconnect. It's uh, it's it's so um, I think obvious to s most people that you know a change in what you put in your body will certainly make a change on the on the outside the, and the physical component and 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 the mental as well. But the soul component is mm -hmm. really what I love that you bring forward in Seven Ports of Power, which I want to go into. Uh, but but one of the most um, intriguing and um just soulfully youthful beautiful experiences that i got to have with you 
in Portugal when we'd come back from an evening that was, it was probably one in the morning because that's when they like to feed us, remember? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, they, are, they are so Euro late. They're like, all right, mm -hmm. we're going to start eating. Remember our table, all we had was bread for yes. like two hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were all like eating our fingers, so jet lagged. But we came yeah. back from one of those lovely evenings, finally satiated. And, and Haley's like, let's go stargaze. <laughs> and yeah. myself and my good friend Sonia Ross that was with, with us and your I think your mom was like it's too cold and there's she bugs so cold and like what are you not talking? a bug person <laughs> she's not a bug it was definitely buggy yeah. and uh and I had a hesitation of like oh really you're gonna lay in the grass and then I was like Tatsy get it together like what a fantastic idea but it was just and then it was it was magical and we didn't have to lay in the grass we kind of laid in the chairs and we didn't mm -hmm. have to get eaten by the bugs mm -hmm. but there were so many stars and that yeah. is is just quintessential you that 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 big deep broad beautiful soul that just mm -hmm. you know brings brings people together and um brings situations together to 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 just lift up so you're and I wish that I had you had gone through your seven points of power there while we were staring at the stars, but you didn't. <laughs> so you have to do it now on the podcast. <laughs> yes, of course. Oh, I I was actually just recently thinking about that um, that moment a few weeks ago, um, oh. because here where where we live, we're in upstate New York, and it, it, not as much light pollution, so that's nice. And my sister has this incredible view from her bedroom window of the sky, and I was like, oh man, it's so full. It reminds me of like when we were in uh, Portugal, but nothing could compare to then. It was so dark, and just everything was lit up. Um, and I love moments like that that remind us um, not only that we are small, but also that we are connected to everything. And I think remembering that um, can be so beneficial in our own journeys with, with health and wellness and, and trying to make the world a better place as well. It, it, it shows us the importance of our own um, journeys and, and that universe within ourselves. And so um, that's really what the seven points of power, you know, works to capture is um, the importance of that inner world and, and tending to it. And so, so the seven <laughs> points of power are wellness, thoughts and mindset, education, world perspective, social media and societal influences, education and creativity and community. So with all of those elements, um, I think we kind of can paint a picture of ourselves and our lives and, and what it's made of, um, but also the ways that those elements impact us. So it's very much a reflective uh, journey through each of those areas and it's it, they, they were really compiled just by my own observation of like the things that made up my own life, but also the things that I saw reflected in the lives of others. So are the seven points of power um, aspects of ourselves that uh, you ask us to look at more deeply about and where we might be lacking so that we can have a full, well-rounded life so that uh, you know, we can see where we're out of balance? Yeah, absolutely. It definitely serves as um, a way to check in with ourselves, like an invitation to those check-ins. And um, I think it's not necessarily from the perspective of like, oh, you know, you're not good enough in this area, so you need to like get better. But even since writing the book, I feel like my perspective on just growing and evolving in general has shifted a bit. I think that everything that we are is like already there and more so we're just like uncovering the many things that have um, kind of hidden that magic from us so in the book it's like an invitation to uncover the the societal noise and and the things that we've been told we need to be or do or the ways we need to look or you know how we have to show up in order to be important um, rather it's just this process of kind of shedding everything versus growing because all that that is um, incredible is already there and we just have to kind of push through those layers of influence and and kind of cultivate our own uh, bubble of influence and of um, nurturance that really supports that essentialness um, that essential power within us and so that's really the the core message of those seven points of power is just like an invitation to those deeper parts of ourselves and to getting to know ourselves in a really um, compassionate and welcoming atmosphere. I think sometimes self-growth can feel like we're just criticizing ourselves or that we're in competition with ourselves in some way. And, 
you know, there are plenty of like motivational quotes that act like you're supposed to beat this version of yourself, but really it's, it's just an evolution process. And I think going through that with compassion and with care and with intention is, is really important. Um, if we want to really get to the, the good stuff within us. Yeah. I love that. I, I just want to comment on what, how your perspective about how we're already there. We just have to chip away at the stuff that keeps us blind from who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a quote, and I'm probably going to screw it up, something about Rodin's sculptures, like all he had to do, it was already in the rock. And mm -hmm. Rodin just had to, to chip away to find the perfect you know, sculptures, uh, mm -hmm. form underneath. So anyway, yeah. no, that's it's, exactly <laughs> it. Yeah. It's in there. So Haley, you, you started happy org, the happy org.org mm -hmm. when you were 12. And so I remember we first met in Washington mm -hmm. before Portugal. I feel like that must've been April or May or something of 2019. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, but I remember, Chris Chamberlain from Effect Partners saying, "Oh, the ha Haley Thomas, your mom, are coming in. She she has the 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 happy org." And I had just started Switch for Good and was feeling like I really didn't know what I was doing, and it was completely it felt like a fish out of water. Yeah. And I remember meeting you, and I'm like, "Okay, I'm 46. I I feel like if she can start this at 12, which is so incredible, <laughs> so mind blowing, so wild, like get it together, Doxy. Like it's, and I remember thinking, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never run an organization before. Obviously mm -hmm. neither, neither had you, but yeah. I went back and speaking about what you two were just discussing about it really, it's already in there. It's just accessing it and pulling it out. I remember going back to re remember reminding myself when I, you know, became a professional athlete. I hadn't done that before either. I had no idea what I was doing. And I was really late to the game, starting cycling at, at, at 26. And so I, I remember thinking, it's in there, Dotsie. Mm -hmm. It's in there for a 12 year old. It's in there. It's in us. And, and so a, I just don't think I've ever told you that. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, thank you. I don't. We didn't really get to spend much time together in Washington. It was just like a one day thing. But mm -hmm. but we certainly did in Portugal. So your journey with 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 Happy. That the what was the first you know moment like when this you know occurred to you? Wow, we have completely you know changed Dad's health and and we're we're all headed on a on a better trajectory mm -hmm. uh, of of health and wellness. Uh, and I want to share this with the world. T tell yeah. us, it's just <laughs> remarkable. I, I feel like I was just so overwhelmed with everything that I had learned and like so confused why nobody had told me about it before. Um, you know, at school, I, I was lucky enough to have like a, a physical education class, but we just ran around and then that was kind of it. You know, there was no greater context of, of well-being at all. Absolutely no reference to um, food and definitely no reference to like mental or emotional well-being. Um, but at that point, that wasn't really my focus. I was just like, every kid needs to know like <laughs> that there is uh, really weird ingredients in, you know, in their favorite chips or you know, in pop tarts or whatever it may be, you know, and um, I just felt kind of betrayed by a lot of my like favorite places and the places that I had enjoyed at some point, you know, like fast food restaurants and stuff like that. So it started out very um, innocent, I guess, in, in terms of it being super simple. I just wanted my friends to know that like eating pizza could clog their arteries or that, you know, um, all of those things were connected in that our generation could easily deal with um, illnesses like my dad did and, and that kids do face, you know, um, health related illnesses. And so um, starting with that want to just share everything I learned, I um, started like a little YouTube channel with my sister called Kids Can Cook. And we just were having fun in our kitchen and like sharing our favorite recipes. And it was very much chaotic and then and, and all over the place, very authentic to being, you know, like, nine and five years old uh so it was it was it was definitely a very um 
introductory phase, I would say, you know, I was just trying to figure out how to uh, get my voice out there. And, and through that, eventually I started doing like cooking demos in the community um, in Arizona or where I grew up. But um, eventually I started to realize that I wanted to make an impact, you know, beyond that. And, and I wanted to learn more as well. So I had applied to join um, an organization called the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. And at the time they had uh, like a youth advisory board for kids who wanted to be health advocates in their communities. And so I just applied to like represent the state of Arizona and, and through uh, my story with my dad and just kind of the actions I was taking at the time, um, they accepted me. And that was kind of the the moment that created everything else um, and and led me to to this moment now, which is uh, unbelievable uh, sometimes to really think about that that one <laughs> that one event was really the catalyst for everything uh, because through the organization I, I got to learn a lot more about um, childhood obesity specifically, but also had opportunities to share um, about my journey with my dad like, on big stages, uh, health conferences across the country. And so I just was kind of catapulted into a speaking career. And that wasn't uh, necessarily something I ever envisioned myself doing. Um, I did always love like speaking to people and um, I used to want to be like an actress. So being on stage and things like that was not necessarily new to me. I mean, I was only in like elementary school plays, but I was comfortable to a certain extent with with sharing my voice. And so um, it just kind of morphed into something more purposeful. And that was a, a really beautiful thing to witness. And again, at the time I was like 10. <laughs> and so it, uh, the deeper purpose of it all wasn't really uh, clicking then for me, but I was like, wow, I'm doing something that I really enjoy and people are, are being positively impacted by the story I'm telling. So I want to keep on going. And uh, through that, eventually I, I um, started getting opportunities to like appear on TV and talk about what happened with my dad. And like all of that was really uh, fun and, and different for sure, but I still wasn't making the impact that I felt I could. And so um, that's when I really just went to my mom and started talking about potentially like doing cooking classes for kids in the community and really like hosting summer camps and just doing something a little bit more concrete and where I could feel that impact and, and kind of help redefine the narrative around healthy eating for my generation. And so uh, that's when we decided to start Happy and my mom is co-founder. So we really uh, learned everything together and you know continue to learn together as we you know adapt to uh, all sorts of changes in, in life and our you know collective experience so um, that journey has definitely been eye-opening and it has connected me to a whole other element of um, you know the wellness movement in general and just understanding the many different barriers to wellness and um, how young people also just innately want to kind of make a difference through their stories and their own journeys. I've been able to really uh, affirm that within myself, but also through the examples I've seen in the community. What, um, tell us, you left out a couple very uh, impressive uh, things on your resume on this journey. One, one being that you were uh, on the cooking competition show, Rachel Ray's Kids Cook Off, <laughs> and you also sat next to Michelle Obama at the 2013 State of the Union address because you had been at the at the White House for a kids state dinner uh, a few years before for her mm -hmm. Let's Move campaign. I think your didn't your your corn and yeah salad uh, when black bean corn quinoa salad uh, was like served at this uh, White House uh, luncheon. So that was really uh, yeah a surreal moment, and um, I got to introduce uh, First Lady Michelle, or former First Lady Michelle Obama, um, at the kids state dinner the following year, and then sitting in her box. Um, so all of that, that phase of life is very, <laughs> very um, incredible and, and, and surreal for sure. And getting to like go on the Food Network, that was a, a lifelong or a childhood dream of mine. Um, and so being able to actualize that was really cool. When you were and, still a child. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh uh, yeah, it was, it was really, really uh, cool. Moment. So you were competing, I'm quite sure, against uh, <laughs> uh, kids that were making uh, animal-based food. So, yeah. right? It wasn't yes. the vegan cook-off or anything. If I know Rachel Ray, it was not the vegan cook-off probably. Yeah. Uh, and so what did you decide to make and, and how, did, how did you do? 
Um, I'm trying. I think at the time I I wasn't yet vegan. Like I might have just turned okay. vegan. Um, okay. I was still 12, and I I turned vegan when I was 13. So, um, my dishes were definitely like skewed towards healthier, um, compared to like re- you know typical recipes. But um, I did make like the black bean and corn quinoa salad on the show. Um, it was it was an interesting experience for sure and um (laughs) i'm definitely not made for reality tv um i think in a way too thoughtful interesting (laughs) no i I mean (laughs) no i i mean i was only 12 but i think at that time a lot of things were happening like a lot of um, my dreams were coming true but they were also uh teaching me what i actually wanted like they were showing me um, paths that I could take and and ways I could either sacrifice my authenticity or lean into it more and I think that um, while I'm so grateful for all of those experiences some of them were like bigger lessons than others you know and and really um, helped me develop my own confidence and who I am and not necessarily like an image uh, that maybe others would want to kind of like shape me into um, especially when I was younger, a lot of people wanted me to be like bubblier and like more sassier or whatever to kind of fit into maybe a certain stereotype. Um, And I just couldn't, I I couldn't do it. And I think um, in a way, instead of beating myself up for like not being that character, um, I was able to lean more into who I was. And and that was a very... um, liberating thing for me ultimately and it planted seeds for me to continue to embrace my authenticity rather than forfeit it for more you know screen time or or limelight so Mm -hmm. um that was that was a good experience and lesson and i was still able to meet like some of my favorite you know chefs through the experience so i think it it was great that i was able to have that duality you know to work through some challenges but also have some dreams come true yeah. If we we talk a lot about change on the show, both, you know, personal change and mm-hmm. the desire to make change in our own lives and encouraging others to make change if, if they're if they're so um, uh, intrigued by it. I was really fascinated to, to find out that, you know, when you guys you and your mom we're, we're, we're starting happy in terms of really the integration into to schools and communities and making food for kids. You know, it wasn't like this, you were just, you had this big vegan banner you were carrying around. Right. You know, you just replaced, like you said, the chips and the Pop-Tarts uh, and, and put in, you know, well, I guess corn, you know, black bean quinoa salad mm. or just a lettuce wrap or just a, you know, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or just s- s- something else. But it wasn't that you were driving uh, the change with uh, the, the vegan flag. And so I think that you are uh, w- one of the best at really encouraging real change just by example. How, what is your philosophy on change and how to encourage people to change if they want to. Yeah, yeah, I've been thinking about that a a lot lately. Um, uh, Just as it seems, you know, more and more uh, tragedy just kind of compounds on on humanity and and there are more and more problems that are just so visible and and, and hard to ignore, which is a good thing in in many ways. It it helps us uh, further our acknowledgement of, you know, the suffering of, many individuals and in our planet and, and animals as well, but it can be really, really overwhelming. And I feel we only have like a certain capacity to hold so much grief and, and helplessness. And um, as I've been thinking about that, I'm realizing that there is in a way this kind of liberation in the fact that we can only do so much. Like sometimes it can feel like, oh, you know, I, I can't, just snap my fingers and and change this or nobody's listening to me and you know our government isn't listening and and you know the list goes on and on um but you know in a way kind of coming back into that power that we do have in our example in the way that we choose to live our lives in the way that we choose to nurture ourselves and and those within our circle um 
all of that is so powerful and profound. And I hope that we can continue to or start to really acknowledge the power in, in just living our lives intentionally, um, because that is really the only thing that we can fully control is, is living our lives in a way that fulfills us and feels um, aligned with with the, the greatest potential of, of humanity. That's really the only thing that um, this all boils down to, I feel. And with so many people experiencing um, suffering and trauma and all of these things, I, I feel the more that we open our hearts to creating safe spaces for people and to normalize healing and to normalize um, you know, more holistic thinking and ways of approaching the issues that we face, I feel we'll finally start to turn a new leaf because for so long, I, I think humanity has kind of been embodying everything that it isn't, you know, and <laughs> I think it's time to try something new. And I, 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 I believe it, it wouldn't hurt to try starting with um, ourselves first and kind of tending to the brokenness we find in ourselves and, um, and then letting that healing kind of radiate outwards. Um, because it really is the most powerful thing we can do, you know, each and every day and in each moment. Um, of course, we can take action outwardly, we can start organizations, we can be a part of movements and protests and share our stories and all of those things are so, so important. But I think it really boils down to that everyday interaction, you know, with ourselves and, and those, um, you know, in our communities. So thinking about the gravity of that and the ripple effect that that can make, um, I feel like that's really where a lot of our power lies is in like redefining our own lives so that we can create new blueprints for for living and, and being and to show that that it's possible. You're so wise. I wish I'd known what you uh, it took me at least 10 more years to just even learn what you're saying now. So thank you for that. Um, you know, it's I'm reading a book called Sapiens. It's about the history of homo sapiens and one i'm at the very end and it's talking mm -hmm. about how actually we have fewer wars than we've ever had humans are not fighting as much where we would go to war at the drop of a hat because of globalization mm -hmm. now we just don't do that so that is one that we don't we don't resort to fighting as much um and that it, even though it seems that we do it's because a lot of it has to do with the news and social media in our face mm -hmm. every day so uh, a little bright spot um, but yeah. I would like to ask you, I did read that at one point you did feel that there was an imbalance in your life. You were so busy, but at the end of the day, you were still, you were unhappy and you realized that you needed a, a basic routine in your life. Can you share with us what got you back on track and uh, what, what routine you have in your life that helps you stay happy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think it can be so easy to just get overwhelmed by everything that we're doing, um, you know, whether that's like just a means for survival or even um, something that we're passionate about. It can overwhelm us if we don't create boundaries and um, honor our capacity and or even just begin to understand our capacity um, of like output and giving, you know, especially when we're not taking time to uh, receive <laughs> some peace for ourselves, receive some time and space for ourselves. And so, um, 2019 actually was not a great year for me, even though I, like internally, um, even though I was experiencing so many incredible uh, moments, um, I was just really having a hard time managing everything. And I, I felt like there was nothing I could do to like get, <laughs> get a sense of like an exhale, you know, there was a lot going on. Um, and so I, I feel like through that process, I had to be real with myself. I, I think that it was, it was really the first moment that I had to allow myself to kind of feel everything. I, I very much um, operated off of like the mindset of just, just push through it and like be grateful because look at everything, like look at your life and look at everything that you're able to do. And, uh, you know, look at everything that you're so privileged to, to have and to experience. And it was, it was, um, this kind of positive gaslighting in a way, you know, it was, it, it was so um, dismissive of, of any inkling of like, well, maybe, 
I am tired. You know, maybe I do need to just take a break for a second. Maybe this is too much, you know, and um, I would kind of blow everything out of proportion in terms of like, if I take a break, then everything stops. You know, if I take a break, then I can't do what I'm supposed to be doing. And um, I think ultimately um, after just kind of completely draining myself of, of any energy to to move forward really um I had to just kind of look at myself very truthfully and 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 see how I could support myself more because I was just giving too much and I didn't have anything left for myself I would often say like I have no time for me I have no time for and it was just ridiculous um so in 2019 what I had um initiated was essentially like a a little list called a gtpt list which is um, grateful to prioritize today list and even though it didn't take away um the the amount of obligations i had on my plate because i couldn't um you know make my way out of those at that point it it allowed me to view the things that i was doing um not as like i should or i should do this or i have to do this but more so that i was making a choice to um, and it also prioritized self-care at the beginning of every single day. And so this helped me so much because my excuse was always that I didn't have time. I didn't have time. Uh, but when I started my day affirming to myself that I was important and would set aside like two to three hours to be able to just be, to do whatever I, I wanted, do whatever I needed to, um, that helped me a lot. And just kind of working to reframe a lot of thought patterns that I guess were just running in the background of, of, of my mind for, for years that I really didn't realize were there until they all confronted me at, at once. And so um, that helped me then. But I think what's interesting is that, you know, as we change, our tools for supporting ourselves change as well. And um, that was something that I started to be afraid of as well. It's like, oh, what if this doesn't work? you know, next year, or, you know, there, what if this doesn't work um, a few weeks from now? And I just kind of had to uh, let go of the fear of my future self and instead lean into what I could do now to take care of me and, and understand that the more that I took care of myself, the more I would be able to be in sync with myself as I change so that those tools would also, you know, change in harmony um, with whatever transition. So, It was like just being able to come to a place of um, deeper self-understanding and and reflection, but also doing so um, with kindness and and not beating myself up about not doing everything on my to-do list or, um, you know, not being grateful enough or or whatever it may be. I had to kind of come to accept duality, which just Mm -hmm. naturally exists within us. Like we can be grateful and also very overwhelmed and stressed by our lives or by what's going on in the world. Um, And so I think acknowledging those aspects, those things that kind of work in tandem uh, were really important as well, because I thought you just need to be happy, (laughs) you know, and uh, that that's never the the answer. Um, So, yeah. (laughs) I would love to hear the specifics of like what that routine looks like, Mm -hmm. whatever you're willing to share about it. It, it, yeah. it's, I, I was curious the whole time you were taking me through the, the um, you know, kind of the underbelly of the whys and what happened and, and the instigators that made you wake up and realize I need three hours a day, uh, mm-hmm. basically on self-care. What does that look like in practice? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, only at that point did I feel I needed to allocate that much time just because I really wasn't feeling well and um, I needed to actively like do something to shake up my routine Mm -hmm. and really uh, show myself that I was a priority. Nowadays, my routine is not three hours long. Um, Yeah, it's, it can be like- Darn it, I was ready to like dive into three hours a day (laughs) for myself. Yeah, if if you need it. At the time, it was really like, meditation was a really big thing for me because that helped me um, kind of look at my thoughts in a more disconnected way. I would often like take every thought that I had and make it like identify myself so if I felt like I was tired then I'd be like oh you're so lazy or what you know and it started doing things like that um so 
through meditation, I was really able to kind of disconnect my identity from my thoughts and rather look at my thoughts as almost like little signals to what I needed to take care of. Um, so that was a major part. Another thing was journaling. So I had started journaling in 2019 and that's a practice that I've continued um, through to today. I mean, I was just journaling earlier um, and that really, if, if there's anything that I could recommend to people is to get a journal. It's not like a little, oh, I'm a teenager type of thing. Like really a journal <laughs> is uh, one of the most um, beneficial things that I've introduced to my life. Um, it's really helped me feel safe in expressing myself. Um, it's a place where I can view, you know, my thought processes, my emotions, um, what I'm feeling, what I wish to cultivate and call into my life, what I wish to um, alter or, or get rid of. It's, it's a very safe space for me to kind of tend to the different territories of, of my life. And so um, having that space to explore myself is definitely um, so beneficial and really, really helped me then because I held so much in and um, being able to just let it out was really a big thing. Um, another thing was just like very uh, pampery kind of like self-care practices. So um, even with like my um, skincare routine, I took time to really figure out what actually worked for me and took time to like make the whole process a very loving experience and to try to like speak affirmations to myself as I was doing those routines to just infuse more self-love into that. Um, I started listening to and following, you know, creators and people who really um, also had, you know, the sort of mindset that I was looking to cultivate and um, a sort of self-love that I wanted to reflect to myself. So that helped a lot. Um, and for my morning routine too, I, I just kind of t set aside time to like have my breakfast meals and, and things like that in, in peace and to be able to like actually eat and enjoy my food and maybe, you know, pick different places to have my meal like on the porch or, uh, you know, viewing it through the wind, viewing like trees through the window, whatever it may be, just creating more space to be. And so a lot of times the routine was simple, but I took my time through everything. And I think that sense of like not rushing this process of taking care was also another um, really helpful thing because if I rushed through it, it would kind of send the message that taking care of myself was a burden and I just had to like get it over with. Um, so it was like three hours of maybe three to four activities, but through each of them, I was, I was really taking my time and being gentle through that process. And, and I think that self-care routine, you know, adapts depending on what we need. And through that routine, I would write out like my grateful to prioritize today list and set an affirmation for the day and kind of say like what I wish to feel that day, what I wish to um, experience and contribute. And so having that clarity uh, definitely guided me throughout the day to just kind of be more kind to myself and others, which was really helpful. I love, I'm not an intentional eater at all. I, I think I, I just slough it off as well. I'm, I'm eating plants, I'm not harming anything. And it, so it's like, right. you know, I don't need to sit there and stare at it and be with it. And, but I, I, I do because I'm not honoring myself and even that journey of the fact that I'm eating plants and not eating anything that's hopefully harming others or myself. Uh, it, I'll, I'll just eat straight through work and emails and sometimes straight through the TV at night with my husband, if we're going to yeah. watch a show or the news and um, you're reminding me to, I, I really need to, to be a more intentional eater and take it to a certain place or, you know, with the, with a view or just something, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in nature and just, and just be it's cause I, I, I eat really fast. I think I might slow down if that is, is, um, is part of it, but it's also just energetically so much, mm -hmm. uh, so much healthier for my, obviously my mind and my soul, but my physical body too. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. And I mean, yeah. I'm definitely, I have not perfected, you know, any of these routines and I don't think they're meant to be perfected in, in any way. It's just a, a journey of understanding like what makes your body and soul more comfortable and, and trying to tend to those needs. Um, especially for mindful eating, I think that's something that I'm trying to implement more again uh, because mm -hmm. of 
that, you know, I just need to eat so I can get through it. And, you know, mm. it's just a, a, a basic need I'm fulfilling. But really, like, when you sit with your food and you enjoy it, and more so when you prepare it with that intention of, like, mm -hmm. this is to nourish me, this is to fuel me for the rest of my day, it completely changes uh, your experience you know, with your food, but also connection to your body. So even trying to do, like, the 70 chews, it's a lot, you know, to yeah. <laughs> try to slow down during that time. But it's when I remember to, to do that, it's, it's always nice and kind of helps to ground you. Did you say 70 chews? Because that's a lot for one <laughs> mouthful. I could see 30 maybe or 15 yeah, I think it's even. Like 50 to 70 or something. Oh my God. Like recommended for um, wow. <laughs> the best digestion, I guess. But okay. It's almost <laughs> liquefying whatever it is that you're chewing. <laughs> no. Yes. Um, yeah. Haley, tell us what's next for you before we, uh, before we wrap up with our five questions that we ask at all our guests now. Um, what, what's next for you? Yes. Um, well, I recently, um, a few months ago, actually, uh, almost three months ago, opened up uh, a tea house with my family. Um, so it's like a physical like cafe uh, where we serve um, vegan treats and matcha lattes. Uh, it's called Matcha Thomas, and it's in uh, Beacon, New York. And um, that's been a very, very new adventure, uh, a huge leap. Um, and very just serendipitous uh, unfolding for sure. Um, it's always been a dream of mine and, and my sister as well, especially to like open up a, a cafe or place where wow. people could like try uh, vegan treats and like nourish themselves, but also come into a, a place that feels really peaceful and welcoming and kind of calls people into that uh, sense of well being and, and introspection. And so uh, we were actually able to uh, actualize that this year and and so uh, we've been running it for three months now and um, it's been so amazing it's definitely been really challenging and, and a new experience as well and has also uh, continued to teach me more about um, the importance of self-care and setting yeah. those boundaries and it's just like I feel like life will just continue to uh, remind us of that of like you know to take care mm -hmm. of you first um, but it's been amazing so um, that's definitely really exciting and new. Um, mm -hmm. And other than that, I think um, I'm just continuing to kind of lean into a more expansive way of, of looking at my activism uh, as well. I think that with a lot of my focus going towards um, the shop, it, it definitely was kind of disorienting because I wasn't spending most of my time doing the things I've been doing for like over a decade now. and. And so I, I felt as though like, wow, the ways I'm making an impact is shifting in such a different way. And I, I was feeling um, I, like just a little uneasy about the ways that I was showing up and how I used to mm. and like comparing what I used to do to what's happening now and, and feeling like maybe I just wasn't doing enough. But I've kind of been coming to this place of accepting the ways that um, that I make an impact and the ways that we make an impact should change and evolve as we grow and that there are like infinite ways to, uh, to positively affect change. And so um, for us, we have a very grand intention of um, creating a space for compassionate living and compassionate um, you know, interaction with fellow humans. We have like a matcha for the people wall where people can buy um, drinks and snacks for each other and then you can like come in and redeem the ticket so uh, for example it could the ticket could say like uh, matcha thomas latte for um you know someone who's had a hard week and they can just like take that oh, and get cool. a free latte so it's like through things like that um oh, i'm beautiful. still ultimately you know initiating my mission and and um cultivating that and so i'm just reminding myself that that change is um important and it can also remind me that there are just infinite ways to to make a difference in this world. So that's definitely uh, been new, just going through a, a whole new form of activism. But it's it's been really really great and, and heartwarming as well. Congratulations! Yeah. I want to come. It's so exciting. I didn't know you guys had done that. Tell tell your mom high five. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah thank you. Oh. So we're gonna just do five questions to wrap up this wonderful show. Um, 
that we've been started asking our guests mm -hmm. and uh, short answers, just rapid fire. Uh, you didn't prepare, so just, yes, just no. go with your heart. <laughs> okay. What is the worst advice you've ever gotten? There was like an event that I was speaking at and um, the, I guess the like head of the company um, after at my talk and like sharing about my journey and everything, um, he had come up to me, an older gentleman, um, and he was like, you know, I'd love to talk to you a little bit. Oh no, he went up to my mom and it was like, I'd love to talk to Haley like a little bit more later. And my mom was like, oh great, you know? And so she was telling me like, hey, you need to make sure you speak with him um, before this event is over. And so like I sat down with him and um, basically he was telling me like, if you choose not to go to college, you're going to be like way behind your peers and there's no way that you can catch up if you don't follow that path. And so I you know, decided not to go to college a few years ago. Um, but hearing this, it, it, it presented an opportunity for me to like stand up for myself and the path that I was taking and and I think the worst advice or kind of feedback that I received actually motivated me so much more to be very clear on my reasons why I choose to live my life in the way that I do. Okay, we've already talked about this, but what's one thing you try to do each day that really makes an impactful difference in your life? Um, I would say journaling for sure. Mm -hmm. Share something with us beautiful that happened to you in the last 24 hours. Oh, um, something beautiful. Uh, Yesterday, so this is still in the past 24 hours, um, I took a two hour nap in my personal tent in my backyard and it was perfect. <laughs> Love it. Yes. What is one thing that you do to shake off stress? We talked about this too, but uh, yeah. Um, there, are, there are many things, but I would say um, one fun thing that I do to shake off personal stress is um, learn like different dance routines with my sister. We've been doing that uh, all year and, and that's been really fun and like a way to just kind of exert energy um, in a different fun way. What is one good habit that you're proud to have cultivated? Just being a, a safe space for myself. I think that is one of the, the greatest gifts that I have is the fact that I'm my own best friend, which is really good to say. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Haley. Uh, everybody, um, you are actually our youngest guest, I think, right? Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody yeah. needs to go check out the cookbook uh, Living Lively to learn not only how to cook delicious food, but also be your own best friend by uh, following the prompts in the book. Thank you so much, Haley. Thank you. Hey folks. Okay, back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.